Welcome back to Energy, Environment, and Everyday Life. We're going to talk more about electricity. Remember, electricity is a medium. Electricity doesn't come out of the ground or it doesn't come out from the air. We actually use fuels, primary energy sources, to make electricity. But electricity is so useful in the end and a wonderful way to transmit power that it has become an ever-increasing proportion of our primary energy going into making it. What is that primary energy? Well, here are the statistics for the United States in 2014. And you can see that fossil fuels still dominates, and particularly coal. In the U.S., this is about all we use coal for. But if we add up the coal and the natural gas, that's still two-thirds of all of our electricity comes from fossil fuels. The next largest is nuclear. One out of five light bulbs in the United States is run by nuclear power. In France, that number is something like 85 percent. Then there's a big gap, and we get to the renewable energies. Hydroelectric power in the United States, we pretty much have dams wherever we could put dams. And as long as it keeps raining, we will have hydroelectric power. The next one is wind. Now, wind is fascinating because that number, this 4.4 percent, that's a lot of electricity. When I first started teaching about uh, introduction to energy sources, that number was tiny. And even a few years ago, it was more like 2 percent of the electricity in the United States. And that's very, very exciting. Having wind turbines, being able to utilize the windy spots with good technology is a wonderful renewable energy source. Then we go down to the bottom set of things. You can see there's wood. Mostly that's from the wood products and paper industry. They burn the sawdust and the branches and the bark and the things they can't use to make electricity to run the saws and run the rest of the processes. Oil, still some places diesel fuel is used to make electricity directly. And then you get the solar. I actually do work in solar energy, making solar cells with plasmas, and I love solar. But it's still a tiny fraction of the electricity produced in the United States, in large part because, well, it's dark and it's a very distributed energy source. Finally, there's geothermal from one basic geothermal power plant in the U.S. You only can use that where there happens to be basically steam or rocks hot enough to make steam close to the surface and not by an active volcano. Here's a view of this in another form. This is 2015. You can see the numbers haven't changed much, but it gives you more of a graphic that shows what comes from uh, gas in the blue and coal in the red and nuclear in the yellow and then the other sources. So those are our energy sources. When you look at the energy sources and you think about the renewables, particularly wind and solar, a 10 times, 100 fold growth would be awesome difficult. You have to remember that wind and solar are intermittent. The wind is not always blowing. and It's guaranteed to get dark every night. This poses great difficulties for using them in the electricity supply. And here's why. Here is the big problem. Look at the variation from day to day and from hour to hour. I realize this is just one particular location. But you can see that on Saturday, very little power is used compared to days during the week. And then you have this hour by hour variation. So just think about this for a moment, right? So you go along and you're asleep. Wonderful. Very little power use. Yeah, you got some things on in the background. Maybe this is 10% of your daily use right now is going here. But then your alarm clock goes off. All right, and you get up and you turn on the lights and you turn on the coffee maker, you turn on the microwave and the TV and the shower and the water heater and everything else. Uh, and then maybe you go to work. But probably not everyone goes to work. So you got other people. So this stays up and goes up and down, right? And then of course you come to the end of the day. You come home, turn more stuff on, it gets dark, lights go on, entertainment devices go on. And then finally, maybe you go to bed, but maybe other people don't and this power still stays up and trails off. 
This type of variation that could go from 10% to 100% during the day is huge. And because of that, you can't just have energy sources that are from renewable sources. You can't just have energy sources that are ones you have no control over when they work. Solar works during the day, unless it's cloudy or rainy. Wind just happens to go when the wind happens to blow. You're going to have to be able to deal with this variation of day-to-day, week-to-week, of hour-to-hour by having a fuel source you have direct control over. Coal or natural gas are easy. You shovel more in, you turn on the spigot. Maybe it could be done with some type of biofuel, but I doubt we'd ever could make enough of it. The point is you have to have control over that energy source. Now, there is a certain advantage of this part down here when none of that electricity is being used. Because, as we'll come to later in the course, this is when you could charge up your electric cars and not have to actually make the huge improvements and additions to power plants because we already have to have this huge variation, this ability to give everyone their electricity in the morning and at night. So to do that task, we need to be able to shuttle power around the country. And that means we need an interconnected electric grid. So we have three grids in the United States, not one. We have the West, Texas, and the East. And you might think this is rather strange. What happened to Canada? Well, Canada is either on the East or the West grid. It's continuous. All right? Mexico is not. Mexico is a separate power grid. But again, in the country like the United States, Texas is part of the United States and the West is connected to the East, why isn't it one grid? And why can't we make it one grid? There is geography. The West and the East are separated by the Rocky Mountains, sparsely populated, difficult for transmission lines. That's one reason. Texas, because Texas was settled and electrified back when only the East Coast was and not much was in between. But today, why can't you connect them? And the problem is that this power is not in phase. So this is a sinusoid, right? And if this is where one grid is, but the other grid is out of phase with the other one, and you try to add those two powers together, you would not have the ability to transmit that power across. You'd have a lot of problems, just like this demonstration. You see here that one student can jump rope because the signal is in phase. But if you throw in a second rope going at a different speed and a different turning, everything goes to pieces. So we have three different electric grids in the United States. And, of course, within each of those grids, we are going to have to have uh, transmission lines, right? A power line. One power plant puts power in. That power could be used in multiple places. So if we actually look at the transmission lines, and these color codes go for how many voltages, the voltage of the given power lines, you can also see how this purple area here, Texas, is sort of disconnected from the east, and everything is disconnected from the west. The ability to move power from one location to another and to be able to even out this load is a tremendous undertaking and a difficult one. And since the United States only spans three hours of time zone, to get rid of the day-night variation is almost impossible. And what this means is that we need to have sources of electricity that can be turned on and off at will. It would be impossible to run the whole grid on something like wind or solar. Not because there's nothing wrong inherently with electricity from wind or solar, it's the same electricity, but you need to be able to meet the high demand peaks. If it wasn't sunny or it wasn't windy at those demand points, there'd be no electricity available. And that means you need to have things that you can 
add, you can shovel the coal in, you can turn up the spigot of the natural gas to be able to meet those high peaks of demand that could occur at various times in various places across the country or at least within each of the power grid units. Here's a map of the flow of power. You can see there's a very large red line of flow from uh, northern Illinois, where there's quite a concentration of nuclear power plants, to the rest of the Midwest. You can also see almost, you can tell that's Hoover Dam and other things in Arizona that can power into California, where there's a much higher population. And the, you can also see the lack of lines between the three independent power grids, uh, south of Texas, which is there in the gray, the west, and the east themselves. So the flow of power, the ability to generate it, means that until we can invent something really new, some fraction, in fact probably a significant fraction of our power, will need to be made by a fuel source you can throw into it, very likely a fossil fuel source. That's what you need to know about electricity.